Here's verse 20. It says, but when he had considered this, that is verses 18 and 19, Mary comes back uh, pregnant from a three-month trip to Zechariah and Elizabeth's house. And, and he is a righteous man and he's considered, she, he figures, she, he assumes that she's committed adultery uh, and is pregnant. And he doesn't want to disgrace her in verse 19, but he has chosen to divorce her privately. And now we come to verse 20. And when he had considered this, that's what he had considered. Behold, an angel of the Lord, probably Gabriel, he has been the key teacher of Messiah. He is, that's, that's what his primary role, or one of his primary roles. It's the primary role in the verse story. Behold, when he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, that's really an important address. That salutation, you, listen, you want to pay attention to any salutation, but especially when God gives it. Like when he met, when he met, um, uh, when he met Mary, remember when it, the same angel of the Lord uh, appeared uh, or presented himself to Mary, the salutation he gave her was dynamite. If you remember, hail favored one. You always pay attention to that. You always pay attention. Like you always pay attention. Even when Jesus, when he gives a salutation to one of his disciples, see how he addresses him. Simon, son of Jonah. You pay attention to that. Or if he says, Saul of Tarsus, what do you think you're doing? You're persecuting me. What business, what business do you have persecuting me? Remember that was on the road to, the, you always pay attention to that, especially when God, the Father, the God, the Son, or God, the Holy Spirit addresses somebody, you always want to pay attention to that. That's a big deal. That's an eternal, that's an eternal title. So this is really important. He connects them with Matthew 1, 7, 1, he connects them. When he says, Joseph, son of David, he's just attached him to Matthew 1 through 17, which is the genealogy. I mean, that's a big deal. I mean, See, that's not who he is. Look, at in his personal life, he's not the son of David. In his personal, in his personal genealogy, he's the son of Jacob, right? If you, if you, yeah, if you read the, the genealogy of Matthew 1 through 17, his father is Jacob. That's not what he said here. He, he connected him with the story of Matthew 1 through 17, which is the story of the first coming of Christ. That's really important. But anyhow, uh, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. He, he, I mean, boy, I mean, you know one thing I like about when God deals with you? He goes, he gets right to the issue, doesn't he? He don't beat around a bush. You know, that's why he says to you, this is why he says to you in great kindness, confess your sin. You know what a wonderful, listen, you could be deep in the stuff up to your eyeballs. All he says is confess your sin. I, I, he, it's a, he, puts his, he puts his finger right on the problem every time. He don't beat around a bush with you. He puts his finger, he says, don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. I mean, you can't operate out of fear and doubt, distrust. You know what his life is filled right, right now? Even though he's decided I'm going to divorce her. It's all wrong, right? His decisions all based on a false premise. Every bit of it. It doesn't mean that he didn't think it out seriously. It doesn't mean that he didn't think it out doctrinally, but he started with a false premise. He falls with a, a false assumption led to a false interpretation, a false expectation, a false application. That's the problem with that. What confession of sin does, it, listen, when you confess your sin, you ought to pay attention to the sin because he just put, he put his finger on a problem. Whatever the sin is, is a cluster involved in. There's a whole bunch of stuff involved in whatever you confessed. See, when you confess your sin, you're confessing what God calls sin. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. You don't know what sin is unless God tells you. I mean, you don't confess the things people tell you is sin. You confess the things that God tells you, right? 
If we confessed what everybody told us was sin, we'd be confessing all kinds of stuff all day long. <laughs> you confess what God tells you. He tells you what sin is. The Bible tells you what sin is. But when you confess your sin, he's just put his finger on a problem in your life. There's, there are good, there's a good reason in your heart why you go to the flesh instead of the spirit. Do you understand that? Uh, boy, you better start understanding that. This is 101, Chris, this is 101 spirituality. He always puts a confession of sin is putting his finger right in your problem. He does it as a gentleman. He does it as a gentleman. But when he puts it on there, you ought to be paying attention to it. That same old pattern in your life of, of anger, that same old pattern of fear, that same old pattern of doubt, that same old pattern of I've got to see it before I believe it. Whatever that miserable pattern is in your life that keeps you from being able to step over that, that doubt or fear or distrust to get to a place where God can meet your needs in a full, complete way. That's pretty good stuff. So he goes on, he says, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife for that which, that's neuter, for that which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. See, the problem with Joseph in the beginning of this story, he perceived what she did not conceive. And God has got to change his mind so that he perceives what's been conceived. Do you understand that? Do you understand that? Yes. Okay. There's a real problem with that. Okay. So what I've titled my lesson, for whatever reason, God sent Gabriel on a, a 911 emergency call to Joseph. Because he is about, he's, in, he's sleeping in the morning. This thing's all going to come into full bloom in the morning. When he gets out of bed and his feet hit the floor, it's rolling, right? Because he's, he's made his decision, went to bed and is getting a good night's sleep. That's what he thought. And in the morning, listen, I'm going to sleep on tonight in the morning. I'll deal with it, right? We all do that, don't we? I'll sleep on it. I've, I've, I've said as much as I can think. I've prayed as much as I can pray. I'm going to go to bed tonight. In the morning, I'll deal with it, which is sometimes really good advice, isn't it? I mean, the best advice is to deal before you go to bed, but sometimes you can't. But he was, in the morning, he was going to get up, and so God pulled a 911 emergency on him, and, and I, I want you to see that. Well, I got interested at 911 business, and I thought, well, when did that, what I was at really after is how many, how many 911s are, are, are used a day in America? It is so many, they couldn't compute it. So I thought, well, I'll go to Alabama. How many do we have? I, they couldn't compute it. So, I mean, there's a lot. You know what has blown this out? Th this was interesting to me as far as study. You know, you know what, what has blown this out? The cell phone. The cell phone has blown this, and I'm just talking about America. The cell phone has blown that so far out that they can't keep up. It used to be they'd just come through on a regular line and all that. They, it was a simple thing to do it. Now it's, it's so far out there. But I did find this, and I thought it was in a place. The first recorded 911 call came from Haley, Alabama. Haleyville? <laughs> I went, you got to be kidding me. Haleyville, this is the first. The first 911 call came from, it's recorded as and February the 16th, 1968. At least they got one. At least they got the first one. Well, anyhow, in our lesson, uh, let's, let's stop and have a word of prayer. Let's stop and have a word of prayer. You take that moment in your own silence, especially those who are visiting with us by the internet. Listen, you got to get yourself in a position, if you're going to listen to this Bible study, where you're not distracted by telephones, cell phones, televisions, that kind of thing. So the Holy Spirit can get you into the depths of your heart without distractions and begin to teach you things that need to, you need to hear tonight. Father, we're thankful today for 
the wonderful privilege we have to confess our sin. So that in Bible study, the Holy Spirit can minister the truth to our life and reveal to us the directive will of God in most the unique and special ways. In neutrality, the classroom, not in the hard life experiences, but in the classroom. So I pray, Father, you would minister tonight the truth of the word of God under the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit as we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us, and we thank you for that, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. So in our, in our lesson, the emergency was that Joseph was about to divorce Mary based on a false assumption. His assumption was her pregnancy was due to adultery. Yeah. It was a false assumption, but nevertheless, he ran a, a whole doctrinal system on it. Now, he ran a, he ran a very good doctrinal system. He, he ran categorical doctrine really well, but it was based on false premise. So once you have a false assumption, it leads to a false interpretation, a false expectation. Remember, we learned this, and a false application. Now he's so God has to do a nine one 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 on him with Gabriel. He sends him in on an emergency, and and that's what my lessons about. I'm going to talk about three things tonight about it. And I thought I thought I should begin with Mary's side. It's not, it's not told here, but I want to begin with Mary's side of the story since, listen, since she's the only one who really knows the truth of what happened. She's the only one that knows the truth about her pregnancy and the charge of adultery And how tough that must have been on her since this charge came from Joseph. Hmm. How tough one that must have been. I mean, that, that. And, it, and he's acting upon it. He's taking legal action upon it as if it is absolutely 100% truth. I mean, that's got to be devastating to her, wouldn't you think? I mean, when I studied this, I went... Oh, my goodness. And listen, there's no way out of this for her. Because 100% of the court's going to agree with him. 100%. But, you know, who's not? His, his assumption is based on the natural law of copulation, isn't it? But who's going to disagree with that? And so, I mean, this has got to be devastating on her part. It's got to be. I mean, this is a Romans 8, 28 deal, isn't it? I mean, that she's got to get a hold of it in her life. And, and listen, everybody, her family go like, oh, yeah, right. His family, oh, yeah, right. The, the, you know, the synagogue, oh, yeah, right. Right? And so I, I thought a great deal about this. When she returned pregnant from visiting Elizabeth, she must have been excited for the birth of, of uh, John the Baptist to her aged aunt and uncle, as well as her conception by the Holy, her conception by the Holy Spirit. I mean, two wonderful. In fact, these things were so high in the, in the miracles of God that God described these two events as what's impossible with men is po only possible with God. That's how big these two events were. These were not light events. This was not just, you know, a 20-year-old girl, uh, you know, recently married, having a baby. That's not what this is about. I mean, this was the atmosphere was two enormous miracles had just occurred, and she was the center of being part of that. Do you, you understand how big that deal was and how exciting? She's a spiritual person. And how exciting that must have been in her life to be that God had chose her to be in part of that wonderful ministry at the same time. And later she's going to see how great God was when he put the forerunner to the Messiah in her aunt and put the Messiah in her. I mean, I mean, this is a lady's day out, if there ever was, right? I mean... 
This is the LOL of our church in it, Jackie. This is LOL right here. Ladies of the Lord, boy. And what a, what a glorious time that must have been in her. And she probably thought that the one person in the whole world that would believe and rejoice with her would be her righteous Joseph. I'm thinking that. She could have never believed that Joseph would believe the worst rather than the best of her. I believe that. She probably never thought that when she responded to Gabriel's message that she would carry the Messiah, when she said, behold, the bond slave of the Lord may it be done to me according to your word. She probably never thought that it would all come down like this in her life. She probably was thinking, I'm going to tell my wonderful heavenly father that it would be my highest privilege to be chosen for this wonderful ministry. And when I go home, I know my beloved Joseph is going to be excited about this with me. Mm. You see, this was Mary's behold moment of a life changing transformation of truth. Did you notice in this story that the friendship love that she had with, with Joseph and the romantic love that she had with Joseph were not able to survive this relationship test by two spiritual mature believers? Think about that for a moment. Let that sink in. You see, what's missing Watch this now. What's missing is 1 John 4. I want you to go there with me. Here's what's missing. Here's what's missing. You, you be careful. Be careful in your own life. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful in your own life. I say it to myself. Here is 16 through 19. And, and, and I want you to pay attention to some of this stuff. I can... Verse 16, there's a part A and a part B. Here's part A. And we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. Do you know how important that is? Listen, if you don't get those two things, the rest of this verse to through verse 19 or this great subject on agape love will be, be missed in your life. If there's one love in your life that's not dependent on anybody but God himself is agape love. And if you tell me that you don't have agape love, you're looking in all the wrong places because you got this one. This is the one love in your life that can be consistent and fulfilling and it has nothing to do with other people but God alone. You understand that? Oh, I tell you, you need to understand that. And here's what you have to do. You have to come to know and believe uh, something about agape love. Here's what he says. God is love. See, that's a statement, isn't it? God is love. There it is. Boom. Nothing more, nothing less. God is love. That's part B. And the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. That's a promise. There is no such thing as a believer not having the fulfillment of agape love in their life. Listen, suppose your husband don't give it to you. Suppose your husband, he, that he's, he's, he's required to give that to you, right? E Ephesians, come on now. Suppose he doesn't. Does that mean you don't have it? No, just means you don't have it from him. Can you still have a completed love life in your heart? Absolutely, but it has to go to another man. It has to go th through the Lord to God. God, listen, it, God is what? 
If you have to tell yourself that every day of your life, 26,000 times, be sure to tell it because those who know it and believe it, receive it. I can't tell you how many, how many women over the course of my life, I'm talking about church people, I'm talking about Marys and Josephs who believe in their heart that they don't have that love because they think it only can come from a man or another person. The truth is, it comes from God. If it comes from the other person, probably it's conditional. And that's not agape love. That's stork A or something else. Well, God is a person, yeah. Yeah, God is a person. God is love. And the one who abides in love, it doesn't say the one who abides in God. It says the one who abides in love, then he gets the fulfillment of the love. Say, abides in God. Who abides in love, in love abides in God, and God abides in him, right? Because God is the source. Now watch verse 17. By this, knowing and believing and getting this system down in your soul, by, by this, love is what? You know what that means? You know what it means? It means completed. It means it's reached its goal. It means it's, it's in total fulfillment of what its purpose is. That's what that means. Perfect. Teleos. That's what that means. Love is perfected with us. Right there? With us. Now watch this. That we may have confidence. Look at the words now. We went from knowing, believing something into confidence about it. Do you see that? You know what that? That's spiritual growth maturity. It's bringing this exercise of God's love through the faith cycle from the hearing and believing side into the application side. Do you get that? Okay. That we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. Watch this down, verse 18. If you've got this, if you've got these verses, now you're ab he's about to, he's about to point push the elevator and take you to the penthouse. There is no fear in love. There, it, that's an absolute. There is no fear in love. And what kind of love is he talking about? 16, 17. There is no fear in love, but perfect love, we just, know, we just saw what that is, perfect love. That's love that God gives you 100% on the basis of grace, not in your character, not in the character of somebody else. He gives that based on his character with you. He says, but perfect love, we just saw it up there. Perfect love does what? Cast out fear. Love, listen, they can't, they can't coexist. They cannot coexist. Because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfect, perfected in love. Then he comes to another principle. See, he's giving you, he's giving you about three or four very clear principles. God is love and etc. Now he's come down, there's no fear in love. He's come down to a simple principle. We love because he first loved us. Yeah. We love because he first loved us. Listen, it's always about your first love. With God. It's always about first love with God. Listen, when you're telling me you're not getting a love from where you where you should get, well, that's not your problem. It's not your problem until you buy into that false assumption. Your husband doesn't have to ha, ha, does not have to love you in order for you to be loved in a complete, perfect way, right? Are you are you reading that? Okay. How good that would that be for you if he did that? Well, that would be icing on the cake. But we already got the cake. <laughs> that would be the icing on the cake. But you know who would benefit from it? Him. Because he would be doing God's will. He's directed by God to love his wife unconditionally. He's told to love God as Christ loved the church and died for her. That's icing on the cake for the person, for the woman. That's icing on the cake. 
But for him, that's a whole other cake being baked. This is really good stuff here, buddy. I'm telling you, this is good stuff you get, you're getting here, right here tonight. Did you notice that friendship love? Now, let me go back to my point. Re, re, did you notice that friendship love? They had it. Do you know, romantic love, they had it. We're not able to survive the relationship test that they're going through, right? These are two spiritual mature believers. Now, here's the principle. Every crisis in the life of a spiritually advancing believer, every crisis in the life of a spiritually advancing believer is intended to focus attention on the word of God. What's the Bible say? What's the categorical doctrine? What does the Bible say? And wait for a grace solution. There is always a grace solution. The Bible offers you promises. Who's required for the performance? God. Romans 4.21, what God has promised, he is able to perform. And uh, well worth a read is Psalm 16, 7 through 9, that talks about that issue. Here's the second thing. As a spiritual mature believer, Joseph has the doctrinal capacity to think and act according to the directive will of God under maximum pressure. How do I know it? Listen, listen to me. And, and understand, he's not going to pass anything through your life that you're not equal to the test. Would you agree with that? Boy, if you've been around here very long, you should. First, I want you to go to 1 Corinthians 10, 13. I want to show you, I want to show you two parts to this. 1 Corinthians 10.13. Should be on your paper. 10.13. There's two parts to this. I want to, I want to, up in verse 2, I want to read part 1. And when I get to point 3, I'll read part 2. I'll read the whole thing, but I'm, one part applies to one and one to the other. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as common to man. Watch what he says. God is what? Faithful. God is faithful. See, it's like God is love. See, these are biggies. Now, you go like, well, I know God is love. That's 101. But listen, if you don't know that and believe that, you can't push on to, to 200, 300 level of understanding, which I just did with you. So he comes back to a basic, this is a 101, this is, this is basic doctrine, God, like God is love. Isn't that basic? When you look at the character of God, the essence of God, you put the essence of God box up there, and we teach it to the small, little bitty kids, we teach them about God. There it is. God is what? God is love. But you see, he comes back, and here he, he brings out another basic doctrine that ought to be, it's a major basic doctrine that needs to be applied to your, to your, your problems and situation, your crisis is in life. Here's the principle. God is faithful. God is faithful. He's faithful to give you the promise. He's faithful to put it in your soul, and he's, he's faithful to bring it out in a way that great, where where the applause goes to God by grace and not yourself. It's not a work of man. So God is faithful. Watch this now. God is faithful. Watch this now. Who will not allow you to be tempted. Who will, who will not allow you, Joseph. Who will not allow, Joseph. Who will not allow you. Joseph, Joseph, what are you doing? Right? who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. See that? In other words, you're going to have, you're, he's going to teach you ahead of time for what's coming down the pike. That's why Bible study is important. He's going to teach you, he's going to teach it up front, and then he's, he's going to roll it down. Listen, he's going to test the doctrine in your soul so that he can prove to you that he's what? That he's faithful. That's the test. And, and what is he going to prove? To, what he's going to show? He, who will not allow you? Here's what he's going to teach you. He's going to teach you who will not a, allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. And listen, he has to send in Gabriel on a 911 emergency call to Joseph. Right? And listen, he will do that to your life and mine. You know why? God is what? It's faithful. 
But you got to be on the right track. You got to be on the right track. You got to be on the right track. And you should be on the right track or you wouldn't get the test. If you weren't, if you didn't have the information, he wouldn't give you the test, right? Because he's only going to, he's only going to test you to what, what you're what? Able. able. Now, sometimes able, he sets the standard on able. Because I mean, a lot of people think they're not able. But they got the test. The test says you're able. See, if we let, if it was left up to us, we'd never give ourselves a test. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, who's going to do that? Oh, yeah, here, stick that knife in my back. Now, I mean, who's going to do that? Oh, I love that. That's a wonderful thing. Yeah, we do that. He sets it. You got to know when it comes to your life, and it's going to come to your life. If it hasn't already, it's coming to your life. But listen, the test is always there for some good reason. You, know you know what the test is really? There are a lot of tests going on within a test. I mean, very seldom do you ever test with one question, especially if it's a big test. You know what's really going on between God and Joseph? Joseph is getting the father test. This whole thing is about Mary's pregnancy. You know what she's pregnant? You know what you know what she you know who what she's carrying or who she's carrying? The son of God. The son of God. The test there there's a lot of tests going on here. There's a test going on with Mary and word of God and all that. But you know what's going on between Joseph and God? It's the father test. I just put my child inside of his betrothed. Can I trust him? Can I trust him? Does he have the capacity? Yes. If I can't trust him here, what's going to happen when Joseph realizes when this child comes into the world and he realizes that's an adopted child? That's his adopted child. Right? I'll tell you. From that side of it, this is what's going on. There's a, another one down here in there, Mary and Joseph. But there's one between, between a father and a father, which is a big deal for God. This is a big deal. Can I, can I trust this man with my child? Mary was the first to carry the gospel. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation. And I'm going to say that second half of that. Listen, here's what we're, listen. As a spiritual mature believer, Joseph has the capacity to think and act according to the directive will of God under maximum pressure. See, your maximum pressure is whatever level you are of maturity you have. Right? Agreed? I mean, so, right now, sometimes we go through tests, you go like, whew. Sure, I'm sure glad I didn't have that 12 years ago. I know. God wouldn't do that to you. In this, you watch this. Here's, here's Peter talking about in a maxed, max pressure. Peter, max pressure. He says, in this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, <laughs> I know that a little while seems like an eternity when you're going through it. Even though now for a little while, see, he's trying to get you a perspective of what you're going through you think is the end of the world. Even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. And here's the reason why. So that the proof of your faith, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be, I mean, a fire test is a, is a tough one. The fire test may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, isn't that a funny thing to say at the end of a maximum a, a max and a stress crisis in your life. Doesn't that seem strange to you? Well, it did to me. I mean, who would say that to somebody? And I'll tell you. I'll tell you what I saw. I saw now in comparison to the future. 
I saw a now going through the fire test with my eyes on, on listen, the, pr the praise, the glory, and the honor to the future. I go through this now to be rewarded there. I go through this now carrying the banner of God. I do this because God has chosen me to do it. Listen, when you go through this, it's because God has chosen you just as he chose Mary. You're a favored one for this. You're the favored one for this. If, if you're a running back, this call from the coach would say, give it to the fullback. He can get me this one yard. There are, a, a, you know, there are 11 guys on the line. There's, there's tight ends. There's quarterbacks. There's everything. I mean, coach goes, sends it in. Then when he sends it in, the coach believes this guy's got the ball. This guy's going to get me a first down. You see? And when, you, when God calls on you to do that, he's called your number. You're a favored one. I try to tell people that. I'm probably not the best guy in the world to visit hospitals because I see I see the end from the beginning. And he, he doesn't put you in that situation unless you're favored for it. You're, you're highly selected. You've just got to know that in your heart. You've been highly selected for it. Now, you probably wouldn't wish it on it. You wouldn't wish this on yourself. But listen, Mary says it. She salutes him. She said, he says that to her and he says, well, what's up? And he says, this is what God has sent me to tell you. And he gets through and he said, then may, may listen, what can I say to God except may it be done to me according to his word? I mean, I mean, that's a salute and drive forward, man. I mean, that's just, I mean, I say, I think of that and I go, Mary, could, why, why couldn't Joseph do it? And then I think to myself, why can't I do that? Why, why can't we do that? We're prepared for it. We've been selected for it. These two things, the preparation of my soul and the experience of my life, God has brought that together in a fiery trial of some sort. And it's a test. It's one part of it, it's a test on my faith to hold strong. On the other hand, it's a test as God's faithfulness, right? And so when you're going through it, well, sure the now swallows you up, right? And so it's very difficult when you're, you know, you got tubes running in and out of you and all around you and all that stuff and you're in pain. The, the thing is to keep your eyes focused on Christ. I mean, how difficult is it? And I'm just not, you don't have to worry about all this stuff going on. You don't have to worry about everybody running out of your room and doing all this stuff. And all that. You don't have to worry about that. You know, your, your, your job is very simple. Your job is very simple in these crisis situations. It's found in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse 2. You know what it is? Fix your eyes on Jesus. It, wh wh where is that? That's above your problems. That's where it's above. You're laying out of bed. You're laying out of bed. They got all kinds of machines trying to keep you alive. You know where your eyes ought to be? It shouldn't be down there. Your eyes ought to be there because that's where the answer is, right? It, this is not difficult on our part. It's difficult on everybody else's part, but it's easy on our part. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our what? Faith. Oh, of our faith. Come on, people. You're going to go through these things. I mean, look, I stood with my grandma tw two times in my life when she buried her children. Now, I, ne I didn't know the pain and suffering other than to see my grandmother and me experience it with her. It broke my heart to see my grandmother broke. I never saw my mother broke down. I never saw, she was my mama. I never saw my grandmama ever broke down in my life. She was a strong, gutty woman, wonderful lady. I saw my grandmother broken at a grave, and it overwhelmed me. And she was broken because she kept saying to me, it's just, this is just wrong. Parents should not bury children. It should be the other way around. And it, it was an enormous crisis in my life uh, with my grandmother. Listen, we all have that. And it was what we're talking about. You need to be prepared. I mean, everybody has crisis in their life. People in the church, it's great ministry. Listen. People, but I hear people say, I don't know how they do it, Ron. I don't, and I'm, I'm that way. I go like, I, I do that with my wife. I mean, I go like, oh, like how does she do that? I mean, how does she do that? I mean, I was with Chuck Farber, and I thought to myself, how does he do that? 
because your eyes are fixed someplace else other than your crisis. It's the only way you do it. It's the only way you do it. And we all have our own little, listen, we have all kinds of tests. All of them are not physical. All of them are not, you know, but they're all tests. And we all get them. You're not going to have them without growth. They're to test your faith in God's faithfulness. That's what it's about. God is what? Faithful. And so we're all going to do it. And and I love the way Peter starts out with this because he's had to learn this the hard way like all of us sometimes. In this, greatly rejoice. You know, a lot of words you could put with rejoice. Uh, try to squeeze a smile. Uh, try, to, try to have a happy attitude. I mean, there are a lot of things we might say to people, but in this greatly rejoice. Right? I sat with parents in the early days of my ministry with a child with cancer. that began to remove parts from their life, from their body, because the cancer kept moving. And they removed so many parts, visible parts, that the parents said, we can't do this. We can't remove one more part. I mean, there would be nothing. There's, there, there's going to be nothing left. And, then, and they said, well, we don't know. Anything. Listen, you, and it, by then it was like five or six parts off her body. You talk about tough. And I saw this Christian couple never waver in their faith. And I learned the power as a young pastor without the knowledge I have today of the word of God. I was taught by a young couple. Hebrews 12.2. I was taught the power of Hebrews 12.2. Fix your eyes on Jesus. This stuff here, at some point, we're going to pull the plug. And we're going to trust God to tell us when that was. And after about five parts removed, they said, we can't, we cannot take this anymore. And, and, and it's, it's not fair to anybody. And so we, we said, I mean, I didn't have any answers for them. What could I, what could I say? I support, here's my answer. I support whatever you guys do. What do you think, Ron? I support your decision. I can't begin to begin. I can't begin to tell you. What kind of choices these are in your soul? I can't begin. I mean, I can't even phantom what you're going through. But I will support and I will pray and we will do and I'll search the Bible the best I can to find. They held on to Hebrews 12 too. I don't know where they got it. They hid it from me. I didn't have it in my soul to give them. I mean, I was I was probably a bigger basket case than they were. And they read that. They lived on that verse. And they finally went, you can't do one more. Can't take one more part from my baby. And we buried her about a week later. Let me tell you, you got to have something bigger than what your crisis is to hold on to. I'm telling you that. I've sat in a lot of places like that. And listen, can you great can you greatly rejoice? Even though for even though for now, for a little while, if necessary, you go through unbelievable testing. Understand, listen. The only thing I had is I told him, I said, listen. This I know. <laughs> this I know for sure. No matter how many parts they take off from her, that's your choice and your decision. Because the next time you see her, I promise you this based on the word of God, she's going to be absolutely whole. 
It's called the resurrection body. And that for sure I know. So this here, they can replace them. They can do this. They can do that. They can do what they want. And at some point, you guys have got to make a decision on this because it's spreading like wildfire. But I can tell you. And so when I read a passage like this, this is stuff that comes back into my soul after 50, 60 years out here grinding out like Horton. This is stuff. Yeah, you're in the now, and the now has to be dealt with. But listen, when you fix your eyes on Jesus, there's a new light. When I told them that, I'll tell you, they begin to rejoice in the midst of their suffering. They went, oh, yeah, it was like a bell went off in them. They went like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. That's true. And it, it but anyhow, the absolute truth, the absolute truth is, the, is that the problem lies with Joseph, not with Mary. I want you to think about that. You know, I love this, this idea back for that just for a moment. You know, he who holds your future, let's say I wrote this down. He who holds our future holds our now. He who holds our future holds our now. Just always remember that. I always think of this couple. I, I think it in my own life. I go like, hey, Adam, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, man. Get, get, it, don't get your eyes fixed on your problem. Don't get, don't get your eyes fixed on your crisis. Get it fixed, get it fixed on Jesus because there's your solution. There, there's your comfort. Listen. Listen, jo Joseph, better than anybody, knew in his heart that his, his righteous Mary went to spend three months with Elizabeth and Zechariah, this elderly couple who was going to have a baby for ministry. She go for vacation. She went up there to keep the house clean, to do, do laundry, to, to, to cook meals, to, to be a prayer person, to be a, as assistant in any way they needed assistance. And boy, did they ever need it just logistically. They needed somebody spiritually in the midst that could pray and have time to pray and counsel and do all the things that spiritual people do with other people going through crisis in their own life. Joseph knew this is who Mary was. This, he knew that. I, I imagine the last thing she said to him when she hugged him and left was pray for me that I, God would give me great ministry. This is what righteous people do, right? This is what righteous people do with one another. So I think, why wasn't Joseph willing to give Mary the benefit of the doubt? If there was one piece in the whole, person in the whole wide world that you were close to that really knew this person better than anybody, he just, I mean, he, there was no doubt in his mind that he wasn't the father of that baby, right? He didn't have no doubt about that, but he had doubt about her character. He had no doubt about his own character, but he had a lot of doubt about hers. See, that doesn't show a problem with Mary. It shows a problem with Joseph. All right, this stuff God's trying to get out of his life. If you're going to be, if you're going to be the father of my child, you're going to have to step up to the plate, buddy. You're going to have to step up, step up to the plate. You understand that? Why wasn't Joseph more willing to give Mary the benefit of the doubt? Listen, if he will give the mother of, of the son of God doubt, what will he do with my child? Why doesn't, why, why doesn't Joseph research her claim of virgin conception with the word of God? How come he doesn't do that? How come he jumps to conclusions, which are false? Why doesn't he, why doesn't he investigate the most logical thing that she said and search the Bible? Is it possible for a virgin to conceive? Is that possible? The Bible makes it very clear messianically that it's true. Isaiah 7, 14. As a spiritually mature believer, he is acting from conformity to the world in regard to conception. Agreed? 
it's not wrong. His assumption that this is the way children come into the world is some copulation. But he didn't investigate. Are there, are, there, are there any exceptions in the word of God? Because if you're going to find exceptions, you're going to find them in the word of God, right? If you're going to find miracles, you're going to find them in the word of God. They're going to talk about all kinds of them. As a spiritual mature believer, he's acting from conformity to the world, viewing the natural law of conception with Mary, rather than transformity to the word of God, conception by the Holy Spirit, Isaiah said before. Could he have found it? Listen, listen, if you can't find, you, you know what you do? You go to a concordance. If you don't have a concordance, you go to somebody that's got knowledge. He, he was surrounded by people like that. would be too hard on the guy i'm just saying i'm asking questions that i would ask yeah he's got a problem going here and f the father's trying to burn it out of him hey i'm not leaving my son with you with, with this the way you deal you deal with righteous people this way this is the way you deal with righteous people i don't think so buddy you understand what's going on well, i think of all the jokes I know. That's, oh, yeah. Oh, boy. Well, you know, he's got, listen, here's a false assumption that bothers my soul. Is false assumption about Mary. Not just about pregnancy, but about Mary herself. He's, he's charged her. He's charged her with adultery. Right? It's the only way you're going to get divorced. Charge her with adultery. And you know who she, you know what, you know how God described her? You know how God described her char character? Highly favored, highly favored one of God. See, the big question, at least one basic question for me, Joseph, why haven't you researched the Bible regarding the central issue, which is virgin conception? Joseph chose to take Mary to take Mary. Joseph chose to make Mary the cause of his unhappiness, his misery and divorce. Oh, I get so tired of hearing people blame other people without taking any blame on themselves. Oh, I, and I, listen, you don't want to buy into that. That's a victim's mentality and that'll eat you up. But remember, this is not true. He's done all that. He, he's unhappy. He's miserable. And he's going to get a divorce. Right? He's made up of his mind. All this is self-induced misery brought on by a false assumption that he's made. And there's a lot. Listen, when I say when, when you confess your sin, there's a cluster of stuff mixed in with it. This is a good example of Joseph. When God says confess your sin, he doesn't tell you all the bad stuff. You're supposed to weed it out. How come I, I have this? How come I have this problem? I have this fear. I have this insecurity. I have this doubt. I have this fear. You have you at some point you got to ask yourself and deal with that because that's what's breeding it. That's a breeding station for the virus of sin. At some point, you got to shut that thing down. You got to deal with it. Joseph has cr created unnecessary self-induced misery in his life. It is all based on a false assumption. What Joseph perceived was not what was conceived. God intervened, the good news. God intervened because of Joseph's positive volition to do the will, the directive will of God. He had a willing heart to do the will of God. He, he was on the wrong path. But he has a desire to do that. How do I know it? Because he did when he heard it. He went, I, I could have had a V8. God sent Gabriel. Therefore, God sent Gabriel on a 911 emergency mission to his home. Caught him in deep sleep. You know, you know I wrote a note to myself. I wrote, thank God that God is always in charge of his plan. <laughs> Thank God that he's always in charge of the plan. First Corinthians, the 10th chapter, verse 13. I want to read the second half of that, which says about this temptation. He says, but with the temptation, God will provide the way of escape. 
that word escape is an interesting word in the Greek language. It's made up of compound word. It's the ek. It's word ek and then bino. And the ek bino. And, and there's a definite article with it, which makes that really important. But it means to go out. It means to go out or away from something. And the word escape in the English is a very good translation for that. I mean, you're, you're in a place where there's no way out. And the enemy is pouring down on you. There's no way out. Or you're, you've got your son on the altar, the, your only begotten on the altar. He's laid out on the altar. You have the knife ready to do it, right? Because God is testing my faith. And I believe he's faithful, right? And he says in his heart, Hebrews 11, 17 through 19, Abraham says in his heart, here's what I believe. Here's when your eyes get on Jesus. Here's when your eyes get above your crisis. And he says in his heart, I believe that he will raise him from the dead. Because God can't be unfaithful to his own word. You know what he hears? Or something like that. The offering, close enough. The offering is not on the is not on the altar. The offering is in the bush caught. Sorns are caught. You know what that's called? The way of escape. The way out. The way out is always the word of God. The way in is the word of God. The way out is the word of God. The word of God is what you're in. It's, it's going in. It's the word of God. It's while you're in it. It's the word of God. It's going out. It's the word of God. It's always about the word of God. What does the Bible say? You can hang your hat on it because God is faithful to what he's promised. Well, as far as I can get tonight. Oh, one, one other point. And then I've run over like, like that's news. Look at the very bottom down there in bold print on the bottom of your paper. I want you to, I want you to hook up some things. You know what this 911 emergency is? This divine intervention? It's called the overruling will of God. I wanted you to see that. Because you know you have the directive will, the permissive will, and all of that's engaged in this. The directive will of God the permissive will of God and the overruling will. This, the 911 intervention is that. And I wrote it down in the very bottom of your paper for you to uh, get. Okay? Jackie, tell me one thing you learned tonight. Let me, wait, hold that. Let me have a word of prayer. I'll get rid of the internet. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these who have come our way to study with us. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the word of God to the souls of those who have come, those who have left, and those of us who are still here in Jesus' name. Amen.